Okay, this video is chapter four of the book, Poor Man's Way to uh, Prevent Dementia and also to Raise IQ. So this chapter is going to be chapter four about brain anatomy. And, you know, we'll go through some basic anatomy because we're going to, you have to know a little bit of anatomy, not much, but just be able to describe stuff. Okay, so the way I like to teach the brain anatomy is, you know, front to back, top to bottom, side to side. So first of all, we'll do from bottom to top. This is called the three-part brain of McLean. He was an anatomist over at Harvard. And the bottom of the brain is the uh, brain stem here. And this connects down in the medulla into the spinal cord. And that's also called the reptile brain. So the reptile brain is very primitive. A reptile just needs to lay some eggs and it can walk away. So it's very simple. You know, stimulus response, stimulus response. And so then, theoretically, the rest of the central nervous system is built on top of that. Okay, the next step up is like the letter C, like a Chicago Bears football helmet. And that is a continuation of the cingulate gyrus right here in continuity. This is called the isthmus, connects it into the medial temporal lobe, which you can imagine will be right on the side of that. This right here is the corpus callosum. So the cingulate gyrus is right above the corpus callosum. Okay, and that's called the mammal brain. And the mammal brain is, you know, got more responsibility. A mammal raises its young, it nurses its youngs. And a mammal brain is very emotional. Okay, I'm gonna stand out of my seat for one sec because the thing went out of focus. Usually I know if I stand out for a sec here like this, it'll come back into focus typically. Okay, so that is very impulsive. Uh, fight or flight, simple emotional responses, typical animal stuff. Higher up is the cerebral cortex. Cortex, the Latin word, it means uh, like the bark of a tree. So it's the outer part, the periphery. And the relevance of the three-part brain is that the supertentorial brain, this upper part of the brain, the cerebral cortex, the human brain, it's more sophisticated. It's capable of more nuanced thinking. It's capable of delayed gratification, of making a long-term plan and pursuing that. And one of the pieces of wisdom in this is that Let's say you're having a disagreement with your boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, whatever. And you're about to say something kind of mean, impulsive. And you say, you know what? I probably shouldn't say that. I might tick them off and upset them for a long time. I'll just hold my tongue for now. And it's sort of like you have the ability to have judgment. Um, so anyways, being aware, like if you go, gee, I'm a little bit of a mammal mood right now. And I'm acting kind of impulsive and crazy. I better just keep my mouth shut, stick to myself for a day or so till I calm down. Okay, that can be wise. All right. Um, and, and like I said, too, thinking with the cerebral cortex, it's more effortful. It, it, you know, the, the emotional mammal brain, if you will, can do simple automatic things like, you know, how you drive the same way every day. Uh, two plus two equals four, that sort of thing. Whereas the cerebral cortex, you need for more complex thinking. Now that was the brain from bottom to top. Now let's talk about the brain from back to front. And actually, one other key point. Here's a question for you. And Voltaire actually figured this out a long time ago in the 1700s. He says, why do animals have brains, but plants do not? And the reason is because the animals move. You know, animal moves. And as soon as you move, you have to be able to make a value judgment. I'm going to go towards the food over there, the fruits. I'm going to stay away from that over there. It looks like trouble, a bunch of coyotes. Um, and once you are going to make a choice about a destination. You have to navigate there. You have to avoid obstacles. You have to have a memory to remember where you came from. Um, so you have to do a lot of thinking once you start moving. Okay, so that's the purpose of brain, to walk down a path in a forest, a jungle, or a prairie, and to survive. Okay, um, the next thing about the brain is we'll talk now about front to back. Okay, so the back of the brain is we basically consider everything is always a generalization and there's always more complexity but the key points i'm telling you are the essential things for you to be able to understand all kinds of conversation about the brain trust me i've taught this to tons and tons of doctors and what i'm telling you is the key stuff okay the back of the brain is primarily you can think of it as being essentially purely sensory and these are the occipital lobes they are designed for processing vision vision is almost like 50 percent of the brain it's a tremendous amount of our brain is based on visual stuff we're more of a visual animal than anything okay and then this is going to relay information on the outer surface of the brain as sort of the multimodal processing area so the vision will send its inputs to that location all right um, right here is the parietal lobe region and you can look at the brain is based on being like your fist uh, let me see if i can get my well it's hard for me to get my fist exactly right uh, get in the camera here so this would be like the temporal lobe right here your thumb 
This would be the frontal lobe right here. This crease right here is the central sulcus dividing the frontal lobe from the parietal lobe. And in the back right here, that would be like your occipital lobe, your visual cortex. Okay, That's basically the gist of the brain. And uh, this is the parietal lobe here, and that's for sensory. It's called, you know, the, the sensory cortex, the post-central gyrus. Call this the central sulcus right here. This is a post-central gyrus. Touch, proprioception, kinesthetic, you know, balance, position, and whatnot. Okay, right here in the pre-central gyrus, in front of the central sulcus. Sulcus is an indentation between pieces of brain. Gyrus is a piece of brain that has a bulge to it. And so this would be the central gyrus, pre-central gyrus. That is the motor cortex. It carries out a motor plan that is sent to it by the frontal lobes. Now, we talked about the back of the brain being purely sensory. This part of the brain in the middle being motor. And then the front of the brain is more thinking, more abstract. And the more anterior you go on the brain in general, the more abstract it gets, the more capable of complex thought, of integrating lots of sources of information and coming up with a, a complex overall understanding and long-term decision. And then once a decision is made in the frontal lobe, it sends a recommendation what to do, sends an order to the precentral sulcus to carry out a motor plan of what you're going to do. Okay, and that's basically how the brain works from front to back, back to front. Okay, um, one of the things that I think is interesting is we talked about, oh, oh let's actually talk now, I'll get to it in a moment too, I'm going to talk about how the brain maps sort of time and space, but let me show you the, the side part of the brain as well, because that, that'll make, help it to make all more sense. Okay, so now we're going to look at the brain from side to side. Okay, so... The brain here, let me see if I can shrink myself a little bit. This is, you know, the center of the brain. We're now looking at it, you know, from front to back, as if uh, it was like a piece of bread facing you front to back, okay? On an MRI, CAT scan, ultrasound, it's always the same as if you walked into a room and the patient's feet were facing towards you. So this would be the patient's right side. This would be their left side. Okay, so here's the outer surface of the brain, and it's convex. It's like a, a curved surface. So these are called the convexities, the cerebral convexities, Okay, and here, of course, is the center of the brain. This little gray matter ribbon on the periphery is the cortex. Again, it means like the bark of a tree, as you can imagine. That would be like the bark of a tree stump. Okay, this right here is the hippocampus. Hippocampus means seahorse. And the importance is that this is the most important memory center in the brain. And it's located in the medial temporal lobes. Remember when I showed you the mammal brain going from the cingulate gyrus down into the medial temporal lobe? Well, that medial temporal lobe is key part of it is the hippocampus. And that's your memory center. It's a very, very sensitive location for deprivation of oxygen or glucose. So the sad truth is that one of the most fragile parts of the brain is one of the most important parts of the brain. And that's why all this stuff about neurovascular coupling and excitotoxicity is very relevant for the key memory center in your hippocampus. Okay. Now, the other thing too is in the center of the brain is the main location of what is called the default mode network. The default mode network means if you took a patient and you put them on a functional MRI scanner table, let's say it's a type of MRI table, and had them close their eyes and you asked them, so what you thinking about? Most of the time, they're going to tell you they're thinking about a relationship. They're thinking about, oh, you know, my girlfriend, I don't think she liked what I said yesterday, and I got to take her to this movie tonight and cheer her up. Or, you know what, tomorrow I'm going to visit my mother. I got to do something she wants me to do. So what I'm trying to say is the default mode network is constantly thinking about social relationships because social relationships are very important to humans. And it tends to think about something that happened in the past and how it affects planning for something in the future. So in general, the central part of the brain default mode network tends to focus on social things of the past and the future. So that's how it maps time. Okay. On the outer periphery of the brain, that tends to be the task-based network, the executive network, if you will. It's also called, we'll just call it task-based network. And the relevance is you can only think about one thing consciously at a time. So if you're sitting there just daydreaming, wandering, your mind's wandering, you're typically thinking about the past or the future and your social relationships in general. And on the outer surface of your brain is more of like, well, you can even call it your school brain, your task-based brain. And once you're focused on an activity, you're sort of in the middle of doing it, you're paying attention, you're mostly using that network. They're called networks because there's a whole group of associated neurons that become active during these times when you're thinking about, you know, past and uh, future in the default mode network or when you're in the task-based network focused on the present. Okay, so th that what I just told you is actually super important for understanding psychology. 
one of the things that's been noticed is one of the best ways to make yourself happier and to stop obsessing about something that you're worried about is to get busy doing something else. Because once you're busy doing a task, whatever it might be, it could be exercise, it could be participating in whatever else you want to do, or just becoming engaged in your school or your job, whatever it might be, then you go into task-based network. You, it brings you into the present and you forget about the past and the future for a while. And so that's how you do it. And that's why you do it. Okay, um, so getting busy is one of the best things you can do to cheer a person else up. Okay, we'll talk also a little bit more about um, this one spot right here. This is called the insula. It means like a little island. Imagine if you came in here and this is, this is called the insula. Just think of it meaning like a little island. And the relevance is just deep to that is what is called the salience network. So salience means to pay attention. So let's say you're um, trying to focus on reading a book in your hands. And then there's a TV screen on over there, and it can, you keep seeing motion over there. It's very difficult not to look, okay? So what the salience does is it gets you to pay attention to motion. The periphery of our eyes is mostly sort of the rods, if you will. They're, they're for black and white vision. They're very good at, at detecting motion. So what typically happens is we see some motion, and we turn our head to look, and we get the cones, the center part of our eyes, for higher visual uh, focus and to see color. So basically, we see motion, then we look with both of our eyes to get stereoscopic vision, binocular vision, so we can tell what the thing is. Okay, that's how our brain works. And that's why you want to minimize distraction when you're studying. Okay, but this salience network can get us to jump back and forth between, let's say, the task based network and the default mode network. Okay, but so if you're working, you want to minimize distractions, and that's one of the reasons for that salience network. Okay. Let me get this here. All right, now I'm going to show you a transverse section of the brain. And this is like something, you know, pretty common for medical students to take a test and identify all the spots on this picture here. And then they forget them all unless they work with it. But this is how it works. The blue stuff is the fluid in the brain, cerebral spinal fluid. And these are called the ventricles. They're part of like a shock absorber system in the brain. They're also a waste management system, the cerebral spinal fluid. Okay, so this would be the frontal horns of the lateral ventricles, third ventricles right here, occipital horns of the lateral ventricles. This purple thing right here is called the thalamus, and that's really important. The thalamus is sort of the, the connector of the brain that connects the spinal cord and the, and the brain stem up to the cerebral cortex. It's the relay station. Almost everything has to go there to be relayed back and forth. This is the posterior limb of the internal capsule, head, arms, and legs, globus pallidus, putamen, and this is the external capsule out here. The way I remember stuff is I'll look at this and I'll say GP, globus pallidus. GP is um, friends with the internal capsule, okay? Putamen, I remember to put a man out. He's in the doghouse. That's how I can remember this is lateral to GP. So I always would make mnemonics and word associations like that because then you can come to them a lot later and still remember. Okay, so why did we go through all that anatomy? And I can tell you because this is one of the most common locations of strokes. Every day I see a bunch of strokes in this area, tons of them. Okay, the typical stroke in this area is hypertension related and it's called lacunar infarct. Infarct means stroke, dead brain. Lacunar just means a hole. So I see little holes in the brain all the time here in patients from hypertension. Okay. And by the way, infarct means sudden onset dead tissue, like with a stroke, versus apoptosis is slow, gradual death. So infarct, I can see it right on an MRI, and I'll point it. Like this red spot right here, that would be a typical location of a lacunar infarct. What I'm showing you here right now is for bilateral red spots, those are bilateral basal ganglia strokes, okay? There's other things that can cause that, but that's the typical, typical location for basal ganglia, uh, lacunar infarcts. Okay, you can also get them from opioid overdose. A lot of people die from opioid overdose. It's way more common than people think it is. Okay, um, I know a bunch of people have opioid infarcts. I've also seen a lot of people uh, have major complications from cocaine. You know, I've seen people in their 20s having myocardial infarctions and stuff, heart attacks. Okay, uh, also marijuana. Stay away from that stuff. Lots of people are messed up and stupid or having schizophrenic breaks. And, you know, I'm friends with neurologists, and we see lots of people brain damage from marijuana. For You know, a lot of people think it's no big deal. No, it's a big deal. It's a very stupid thing to get oneself involved with. Okay, higher up now in the brain, now we're above the, the uh, 
lateral ventricles, and this is the deep white matter association cortex. So it is the axon. It's got a lot of fat in there because it's wrapped in myelin. Myelin wraps around it like an insulation around an electrical cord. And so let's say the neuron in the cerebral cortex right here wants to send a message from the parietal lobe up to the frontal lobe. It, the cell body will be located here in the cortex. The axon, you know, long extended axon will extend all the way into the frontal lobe to the cortex over here, and then it'll have a synapse onto the dendrites of a neuron over there. So this is all just called the deep white matter. And it's shape, it's in the center of the brain, so it's called centrum, and it's semi-oval in shape, so that's a centrum semi-ovale. Okay. All right, and this is, this is just a patient with a heroin uh, overdose, and this the red stuff here just means wiped out brain tissue. So most common reason I see wiped out brain tissue in the deep white matter is due to silent strokes from ischemia, from hypertension, from diabetes. Okay, but heroin I'll see, sometimes I'll see it extensively. I see it also um, extensively from chemotherapy, for example. But um, that's a characteristic appearance. Okay, now we're getting into what's the most important slide of this talk to understand strokes. Okay, so this artery coming up into the brain is the internal carotid artery. And then it'll bifurcate. There'll be an anterior cerebral. We can't see the anterior cerebral down here. And here's the middle cerebral artery, MCA. Okay. Um, and I look at this many times every day. So the MCA right here has got these little branches that go up into the basal ganglia. Basal ganglia is the deep nuclei of the brain, the ones we just talked about, like globus pallidus and putamen. Okay, so. These lenticulosteri, that's the name of these arteries, go up into the brain parenchyma, and real severe hypertension can shear off one of these vessels and cause a stroke in there, a lacunar infarction. Okay. Now, the blood goes out in the middle cerebral artery, and then it goes up over the convexities. Okay. And then it'll have these deep penetrating arteries that go down into the center of the deep white matter. Now, here's the point. Here's where it gets interesting. I put a skull and crossbones here because this is the most common location to see silent strokes. I'll see tons of these. I can see one patient can have over 200 of them, okay? And it kind of reminds me of that, you know, Paul Ehrlich uh, rivet popping metaphor of you can pop a lot of rivets out of an airplane and it'll still fly pretty well, you know, for a while. But sooner or later, one of those is going to be a big deal and that plane ain't going to work so well. Okay, so what I'm saying here is you can see how this is a screw job either way with hypertension. If your pressure is super high, you're gonna, you know, tear off the origins of one of these lenticular strides and get a lacunar infarct down here. Okay. If your pressure is too low, though, you're not going to get enough blood up over the top here, and you're gonna hypoperfuse, underperfuse the deep white matter here, and you're gonna get a silent stroke right there too. Plus, chronic hypertension is hitting these arteries with a high pulse pressure, big gap between the systolic number and the diastolic number because the systolic is so high with chronic systolic hypertension that it's damaging these arteries in the brain. And when it damages them, they're not able to deliver oxygen and glucose so well. So that also can lead to you getting silent strokes in the deep white matter. Okay, the deep white matter at the level of the ventricles here is called the corona radiata. The deep white matter above the ventricles is called the centrum semiovale. And then down below, this is the third ventricle here. These are the lateral ventricles. At this level, it's the basal ganglia. And these are the three main levels of the brain where we see silent strokes all day long, all day long. Tons and tons and tons of them. Um, so basically with hypertension, you know, you're kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't. And what I mean by that is if your pressure is too high, you're at risk for knocking off a lenticular stride, lacunar infarct. But if your pressure is too low, you might not get blood up over the top and feed into this deep white matter. So the question is, well, what do you do? Well, here's what I would tell you. The human body is designed really well, really, really, really well. And it's got all kinds of checks and balances to make sure everything works well. So if you just give it what you're supposed to eat, it'll tend to function quite well and you don't need to worry about it. When you start trying to bring in an external controller through your medications and whatnot, it gets a little tricky. And that's my point is, why do you have a high blood pressure to begin with? Because you got to get blood to the top of your brain. That's the reason why pressure has to be high. You're pumping against gravity. So you have to be careful about driving the systolic pressure too low. If you take some old guy and he's got a systolic of 170 to get blood to the top of his brain, you give him a real powerful dose of antihypertensive and drop his pressure systolics below 120, you might hyperperfuse the top of his brain and cause some silent strokes in the deep white matter. You don't want to do that. 
And then if you talk about it, like remember McDougall, for example, he would often say he would not treat his hypertensive patients unless they had several home blood pressures checked, you know, to avoid white coat syndrome, meaning just being nervous that the doctor's having a high pressure for that reason. And so he would wait. If they were persistently for a couple months over 150, then he would treat. Other people then said, oh, no, the threshold should be 140. Others said, no, the threshold should be 130. Others said the threshold should be 120. So you have to look at it from the point of view of the drug company. If they make the threshold at which you initiate antihypertensions 150, okay, that's nice. But if you make it 140, you get a lot more patients. You make it 130, you get way more patients. So it's in the interest of the pharmaceutical countries, companies to push some university doc to keep on saying we want the pressure lower, we want the pressure lower. But that's not ne- that's not in the patient's best interest necessarily, okay? Um, so I'm just letting you know that it's you know you can make tremendous difference in controlling blood pressure just by avoiding the fats, avoiding the sodium, eating the plant foods so you get the potassium and the magnesium and whatnot. Okay, but this is really kind of what it comes down to. You want good perfusion of this segment. And also you just want to keep all your arteries open. And that's why I'm such a big stickler on all this stuff and why I think all those high-fat recommendations are stupid is because you want blood supply to this area because if you don't, you're screwed, okay? <laughs> and then you just end up like all these old people with all these little strokes and they're, they're basically kind of stupid. You know, they're real mentally slow. You know, a lot, of them, a lot of them, what I've noticed is they keep their social skills. They're very pleasant and nice, but they're, they're, there's, there's, there's no one home intellectually, okay? And every, every response is real slow. Okay, um, now we're going to talk about the side of the brain, okay, and we don't really need too much of this for our purposes, but I'll just show you that it's actually pretty simple to learn superior, middle, and inferior frontal gyri, okay, you just need to know how to speak English and you can remember that. Here's the central sulcus in red, in front of it is the motor, precentral gyrus, behind it is the the sensory, you know, touch, proprioception, kinesthetic, okay. Um, and the way I usually, and then here in the temporal lobe, it's about the same thing. Superior temporal gyrus, middle temporal gyrus, inferior. Superior, middle, inferior temporal gyri. Easy. Okay, and then what I do is I always look at a complex anatomical region and I ask myself, what's the irreducible minimum from which I could derive the rest? And my trick for doing this stuff, and I would always try to make something up that I could go back to. I would know that if I didn't have to look at this for a couple of months, I'd still be able to derive everything from this. And I look at the snail. So this looks like a snail. This would be the head of the snail. This would be the you know one antenna. Here's the other antenna. And this is the sylvian fissure. So we don't need to go into all the anatomical stuff. But what I'm basically saying is I could draw all this from memory in about one minute, okay? Just because I've seen it so many times and I know where the snail is and that tells me how to do everything. So that's, that's a little trick to memorizing stuff is have some visual metaphor that you use to go back to to make sense of everything. Okay, now we're going to talk about something that's going to be a little more interesting for you. This right here are the, the sort of the fluid systems of the brain. The yellow is the cerebrospinal fluid on the outer surface of the brain. They said it's like a water helmet, like for a football player to protect your brain from shock. It's also a sewer system, a uh, fluid waste management system that is pumped around your brain to kind of keep things clean, if you will, and especially at night while you're asleep, more of this cerebral spinal fluid rinses into the brain parenchyma, and it kind of clears away the waste products from the neurons, okay? Um, this blue stuff is the veins, okay? This is the superior sagittal sinus, inferior sagittal sinus, the straight sinus and whatnot, and the waste products are absorbed largely into the veins. There's also a lymphatic system, I'll show it on, on a cross-sectional picture, a coronal picture here in a moment, that's parallel to the severe sagittal sinus that also takes away some of the waste products of the brain, like let's say some of the proteins, defective proteins, and it's going to send those to the liver. So in a sense, what the brain is doing is outsourcing its waste product. And the way I think of it is, think about Victorian England, where the people would take their chamber pot and pour it out the window onto the street. In a sense, that's what the brain does at night. The brain cannot go offline during the day because it has to maintain very precise. You have to keep that blood-brain barrier intact because you need very precise ionic gradients along the neurons so that when they fire an action potential, the conduction is predictable and effective. Okay, If you were to open up the blood-brain barrier and allow things from the blood and or if you allowed excessive cerebral spinal fluid around the neurons themselves, you would disrupt their ionic gradients. And everything's based on those ionic gradients for firing action potentials. So the brain cells wouldn't be able to function effectively. That's also partly why people get brain fog when they're doing pathologic things, you know, that are, anything that opens up the, the gut barrier tends to simultaneously open up the blood-brain barrier. 
So those will cause brain fog, okay? Because the, the neurons aren't firing as precisely, as quickly as they normally would when there's problems with the blood-brain barrier or when um, there's disruption of the ionic gradients along the plasma membrane of those neurons, okay? So anyways, this idea of the brain's um, the brain going offline at night, that's called the glymphatic system. And the glim, the GL comes from glial. Glial means like glue that holds all the neurons together. Those are support cells of the brain. And then lymphatic is lymphatics of the brain on the outer surface, mostly on the dura, which is an outer layer, um, like the skin of the brain, if you will, on the periphery. Excuse me. Okay. I have another picture of it. It'll make more sense in just a sec if it's, if it's not clear yet. Okay. These are the lymphatics of the brain. They didn't even know the brain had lymphatics until about 10 years ago. And they run, you know, parallel to the sagittal sinus. And that's where some of the waste products will go from the lymphatic system. They'll dump them into the lymphatics. And then those lymphatics will go down to the lymph nodes in the neck. Okay, this is dura mater. So hard mother. It's like the covering around the outer surface of the brain. Also called the pachy meninges. Okay, now here's a little bit more of a close-up of... Um, what happens to the brain at night? So at nighttime, more cerebral spinal fluid, this yellow stuff, rinses along the neurons. These are neurons right here, okay? And the neurons, these little dark spots, that's the brain's waste products. So the neurons will pump out their waste products at night, you know, like Victorian England dumping out their chamber pots. Cerebral final, spinal fluid will rinse along these neurons and it'll rinse the waste products. You know, this will be the perivascular space, the space around the artery when it comes into the brain parenchyma, like those penetrating arteries I showed on that coronal image earlier, you know, where the skull and crossbones was. And um, so this will open up at night. More cerebral spinal fluid will come down along the perivascular space. It's called the perivascular space of Verkau Robin, okay? And then the cerebral spinal fluid will, will move along the parenchyma, along the brain tissue itself, and it'll rinse these waste products into the perivascular space around the vein. And then this will be absorbed through the cerebral spinal fluid. Some of it goes into the vein. And it's then just taken to the liver for processing, okay, to get it out of the brain's area, okay. The main support cell in the brain is these astrocytes. Astro means like a star. Site means cell. Okay, they're kind of like the mama cells to the neurons. They do a lot of stuff to help them. Okay. Um, oh, and that's about all I've got for this Chapter 4. But I want to say one more thing to you about the brain that I think you're going to find rather interesting is how does a brain, we talked about how the brain maps time. The brain maps time, as we said, by the center of the brain being the past and the future. You know, the past and the future. Okay, that's the default mode network. We talk about the present being mapped on the outer surface of the brain, being involved in a task. But what I think is even more interesting is how does the brain handle cognitive space? How do we navigate cognitive space? And the way it does it is with, you know, analogy and metaphor. So basically, anytime you learn something new, first thing you do is you compare it to what you already know. Then you try to put it in a category. Um, and those are ways that we we map, so that's how we map cognitive space. In order to learn something new, you have to associate it in some way with things that you already know. And that's also why the more you know, the more you're able to learn. Um, so that's how we map out cognitive space. And you can put stuff into categories and you compare them with other things. You know, that is a dog, it goes bow wow, like you're teaching a kid. That is a cat, it goes meow, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, so I thought that was kind of interesting. So anyways, that's the relevant brain anatomy. And just with that anatomy I gave you, that's enough. We're gonna, you're going to be able to understand um, everything else we talk about with the brain later. One last thing, I'll talk a little bit about neurons. I can talk about it later too, but just one point I want to make about neuro, neurons and neurotransmitters. 90%, over 90% of the brain neurotransmitters are glutamate. And then let's just say you got about 5% GABA. And of course it's going to vary from area to area in the brain. So glutamate is what turns things on. It's the light switch of the brain, okay, um, to turn it on. And then GABA is the opposite. It's what turns the light switch off to deactivate a neuron's activity. And that's about 95% of brain neurotransmitters. And then here's something that people don't often think about. The remaining 5% is all those things that everybody talks about. Almost nobody in sort of popular you know, pop science ever talks about glutamate and GABA, but those are the most important ones. They talk about serotonin, they talk about acetylcholine, norepinephrine, dopamine, okay? Um, and so uh, that's kind of how it works. So anyways, uh, that's it for brain anatomy, and now we're going we're gonna to keep on getting into more and more complex, interesting stuff. So I uh, hope that's interesting.